Good morning and welcome to what is the second meeting of the Health and Sport Committee for 2018. I would like everyone in the room to put their mobile phones onto silent so that it doesn't interfere with the proceedings this morning. We've received some apologies from members as well, so Jenny Goruth and Brian Whittle will not be with us this morning. The first item on the agenda is the declaration of interests because we have two new members to the committee and this is in accordance with section three of the code of conduct so i would invite the new members so that is lewis mcdonald and david stewart to declare any interests that are relevant to the remit of this committee um david would you like to go first uh, thank you deputy uh, convener uh, could i draw members attention to my role as chair of inverness caledonian thistle trust the largest shareholder in inverness caledonian thistle football club uh, the role is unpaid Thank you very much. And Lewis. Thank you very much. I have no relevant interest to declare. Thank you. So thank you to both of those new members and welcome um, to David and Lewis for joining the Health Committee. And I hope you'll enjoy it as much as we all do. And the second item on the agenda is a choice of convener. So the Parliament has agreed that only members of the Scottish Labour Party are eligible for this nomination as convener of the committee. So that being the case, I would like to invite nominations for the position of convener. Uh, Deputy Convener, can I move Lewis MacDonald? Thank you. Any other nominations? No? So the nomination has been received and I therefore ask the committee to agree that the nomination of Lewis MacDonald and that he be chosen as the convener of the committee are we all agreed? We are. Thank you very much. Congratulations to Lewis on his appointment, and I will now hand over the chair to Lewis so he can carry on the meeting. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Our proceedings uh, in the months ahead, uh, but particularly uh, now, of course, uh, to start with the third item on the agenda for today's meeting, which is an evidence session with NHS Forth Valley. So uh, allow me to welcome to the committee uh, Alex Linkson, the chairman of the board, uh, Cathy Cowan, chief executive, Fiona Ramsey, the director of finance, Angela Wallace, the nurse director, uh, Andrew Murray, the medical director, and also Shona Strachan, who is the chief officer of Cluck Manager and Sterling Health and Social Care Partnership which works with NHS Forth Valley. I believe, uh, Alex Linkson, that you wish to make an opening statement. Thanks very much, convener, and congratulations on your appointment. Uh, first, I'd like to say that while there are many areas that the board is performing well, we fully appreciate that there are other areas where a performance is not where we'd like it to be and needs to be improved. So I'll get that bit up front at the, at the start. And we hope that we have the opportunity to highlight some of the work underway to address the challenges we face and also share some of the many examples of good practice within our board to improve the care and experiences of our patients. It's also important to highlight the advances which have been made to improve the overall health of our local population. Although, like all NHS boards, we have areas of high deprivation, there has been significant improvements in life expectancy, along with reductions in premature deaths from heart disease and strokes. And we regular report on the overall health of our area. We have these reports. <clears throat> we also aim to provide members of this committee with assurances that we, as a board, along with frontline staff across the organisation, and council partners have a clear grip on the areas where we need to improve and are totally focused on addressing these. In addition, I'm confident we also have the right governance and internal and external scrutiny processes in place to monitor and manage our performance. This includes board seminars, which focus on specific topics and challenges in great detail, service visits, along with our main scrutiny committees, performance and resources and clinical governance committees which gives our non-executives the opportunity to scrutinise and question our performance and action plans. We also have a clear strategy for the next five years, shaping the future. Uh, this is our, our document here, shaping the future, and which is closely aligned with the National Health and Social Care Delivery Plan and the strategic plans of our two integrated joint boards. This strategy was shaped through extensive consultations with patients, members of the public and staff. 
This has been taken forward in partnership with neighbouring NHS boards, local councils and other key partners to share best practice and identify innovative and practical solutions. As a board, safety is our key priority, and despite the recent winter pressures, our staff had, have continued to provide high-quality care. This is borne out by the positive and supportive feedback from many of our patients over the last few weeks. And maybe quote just a couple we've received through social media over the, uh, in this one over the last week. I would like to thank the staff at the ICU at Fourth Valley Hospital in Larbert. Sadly, my father died on Sunday, but the care he received was thoroughly professional and much appreciated. Thank you. And the second one, an unexpected visit to NHS Fourth Valley A&E today with daughter who broke a bone in her hand. Fantastic service, brilliant staff, makes me proud to be a civil servant. So these are two of the many projects we've had uh, in this year. We very much welcome the, this opportunity to update the committee on our work and we hope we will be able to answer all your questions. If, however, we are not able to provide all the details you require today, we will seek to provide this information as quickly as possible. Thanks for the opportunity to make this address. i just make one further point. I say Cathy Coyne, Coyne is our chief exec. She's only been in post from the 3rd of January. So that should appear that mind in your questioning. Uh, Fiona Ramsey, who is our Director of Finance, has been acting Chief Exec for the last nine months. So just give some context to our group. Well, uh, of Thank course, you. I'm delighted not to be the only newbie on the block. <laughs> and you have 13 days advantage on me. So I look forward to uh, hearing from you as well as from your colleagues. But I know uh, uh, your colleagues will have a, a good deal to say in answer to your questions. Can I simply ask uh, to start with about the annual review for NHS Fourth Valley. I noted that it took place in September of last year and was a non-ministerial review. I wonder, uh, in your experience, is that uh, a, a new development? Is it a surprising development? Or is it have you become accustomed to uh, reviews in which ministers don't directly take part? Well, I've been chairman for five years now, and I've had five reviews. Two of them have been ministerial, and three have been non-ministerial. As a board, we're re quite re relaxed about either. A, obviously, it's a matter for the minister, whether it's a ministerial review, but uh, they are different. I think uh, when it's ministerial, then it's very much controlled by the actual uh, minister. When it's non-ministerial, then I think we can have more of an interface with our audience. Uh, but both are beneficial and both, in both cases our board is, is scrutinised. Thank you very much. I wonder if I can ask Ash Denham to uh, follow up on some of the issues that were raised at the annual review and uh, had come up previously as well. Thank Ash. you, convener. Good morning to the panel. Thank you for attending the committee this morning. Um, I'd like to just get your view on levels of accountability. So, obviously, as Lewis has just explained, there's an annual review process that's recently started taking place, um, and that's then followed up, if necessary, by a number of action points that need to be looked into. So, in Fourth Valley's case, the action points for the last two years have been pretty much the same, um, suggesting that there's perhaps some challenge, you know, in, in moving forward in those areas. So, how do you view the reviews? Would you say that they are considered instrumental in trying to drive performance forward? I'll let my colleagues come in with the, 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 the detail, but yeah, I think they are. I think it's important for every organisation, probably public sector organisation, to reflect on its performance. So uh, it's part of the performance culture, it's part of holding us to account as a board. So it is a, a valuable process. Now, the two aspects that say uh, progress haven't moved, they are trick issues. One subs, want to deal with that, Andrew? Um, yeah, so our, uh, good morning. Yes, um, my name is Andrew Murray. I'm the, the medical director in NHS Fourth Valley. I've been here for the last uh, um, almost a year. So um, it was my first time at the, this specific annual review. Uh, I did find it helpful. Um, it was um, it was a very constructive discussion. There was there, there was government presence there, so there was opportunity for people to to, to take notes and to, to then compile our feedback. Um, with the specific um, 
point that, that Alec has, has, has raised and, and passed to me around our um, healthcare acquired infections and particularly our, our SABs. Um, we, as a board, as a, as a, a, as a, a group of senior people within the, um, the organisation, we, we see um, the figures around things like SABs and, and we can relate it to other types of infections. Um, so we are very much aware of uh, where the organisation is. We see individual reports from, from different directorates. Um, so we know when, our, uh, when there's any areas of concern. And we also see very clearly, so yesterday I was looking at reports from all four different directorates showing the breakdown of exactly that information of SABs. Um, so I could see that we, in November, we had no, no one in our organisation with a hospital acquired SAB. And that's the area where the acute hospital is, is obviously has to have the absolute highest standards of cleanliness, and that's where we can um, really influence those those figures within the, the, those other SABs headings. There are there are community acquired SABs. So sorry, SABs are staph aureus bacteremias. They're a type of um, blood poisoning, if you like. Um, uh, and we so so actually our numbers when they have been higher, and we were we were discussing this this week. Actually, we th we think that we are now come down to, to what would be a baseline. Um, we, it's difficult to eradicate completely because um, people can be predisposed to, to developing these infections. Um, but what we have seen previously has been community community acquired. Um, so that is that is very difficult for us to influence with a very direct action plan because that could be, um, you know, that could, that could be individuals with, with sustaining trauma in, in the home environment. It could be, it, unfortunately, it could be substance abuse related. That's a, a high risk group. So, so there are different ways to try and influence those numbers. And we've done that through our ADP group um, to, to, again, specifically target where, where we might see people um, running, to, running the risk of SAB with IV drug abuse, for instance. Um, so on the particular point of SABs, yes, we're, we're aware of it. We've seen the num we think the numbers have come uh, have improved. Um, we certainly see the areas where we have a, a very close control over, if you like, um, that, that we can get to the point where we're not seeing any SABs at all. Um, but it's difficult, as I said, to totally eradicate because a lot of treatments in hospital involve putting little bits of plastic into people. And unfortunately, that absolutely predisposes um, a small group of people to, to, to SABs. So in terms of the, the review, it's useful to have it flagged for me first year in the organisation. It's important that it is given the right level of scrutiny. It's, it's, it's a, a key quality indicator for us, but we look at it regularly. As I said, look at it yesterday. We'll look at it some weeks. I can look at that, that information four times at different groups and different committees um, and also see the actions that are being taken to resolve them. Both in terms of supporting what Chairman said in relation to a ministerial um, review or whether it's an NHS board-led uh, review, <clears throat> we have a significant patient and public engagement across all of our indicators. And supporting my colleague in relation to any kind of infection, um, um, this has been um, something that we have, as, as, as Andrew has said, have dealt with at the highest level. Uh, we've had patient and public involvement, even in terms of the clinical environments, coming in, working alongside our doctors and nurses and physios and others, making sure the environment's clean, and also supporting us on key things like hand washing. So we've got really strong governance. The public see this as a measure of how well the health service is performing. Um, for them, although there's lots of targets that may interest them, they often see this as the touchstone of whether a board has really got, as Chairman said, the grip on things. Uh, we have had significant improvement, and as Andrew says, in relation to hospital-acquired staph aureus bacteremias, <clears throat> we have months where there are no, none at all. In small numbers that we have, there are still our patients in our communities, either hospital, um, healthcare acquired or community. We treat them with the exact same vigour should we have a staph aureus bacteremia in a hospital. So we're looking at that incident, whether it's a, a member of our public who's drug using or whether it's someone who's you know, prick their finger when they were pruning their shears or pruning their garden. We look at that to see if there's anything that we can learn from that and then make sure across the system that we're learning and trying preventing them. But they are coming from very unusual or very individual sources, but the board still says this, the same amount of rigour. Our patient and public are really active around this agenda and they work really hard with us, whether it's hand washing, cleaning clinical environments. And again, and Andrew's mentioned it, around the healthcare inquired 
um, infection or the healthcare inspectorate. We are one of the only um, boards in Scotland that haven't had a cleaning mentioned, and that's a real touchstone for the public when they come into our environments. They see clean clinical environments, regardless of whether it's hospital or the community, and then we, have an, we engage with them in terms of what matters to them. And infection control, um, any kind of infection control, is, is something that they have really robust conversations with us. Okay, thank you. So, obviously, the board didn't achieve some of its action points for 2015-16, so I'd like to ask you that as, as a result of not achieving those action points, what then happens? Would the, uh, you know, if that happened again for another year, how would you go forward from there? Could, uh, I, if we could just stick with SABS, quite happen to, to address, but in terms of SABS, I think we've probably plateaued as much as we can do. The figure was a lot worse a number of years. Sorry. But the, the SABS point is a very important yeah. one and, and recognise yeah. that, that, that Andrew and Angela have, have both addressed that in some detail. Yeah. I know other colleagues will want to follow it up. I think Ash's point is more a general point around how you deal with um, reviews and recommendations and what happens when you fail to yeah. uh, meet the standard that you've been yeah. seeking. Well, to. these are carefully considered by our, our board. We take the scrutiny very uh, carefully and we try and understand why we are in that position and what actions were taken to improve the performance. But this is ongoing scrutiny we do as a board. None of these points that come out of the, the action plan from the review are news to us. We are aware of them. They're things we are already working on. They're all well within our actual site. There's never been any surprises as such. They're all areas that we are actively working on. If, if Government require anything further at that point? I mean, obviously they will want you to um, keep them informed. But is there anything else that they require? To say there was a couple of uh, points to add on in terms of scrutiny. Some of the areas that are in um, each subsequent year. So one of them is finance. I would expect it wasn't that there was any particular issues with our performance. Um, we've always achieved our financial targets, but actually with the risk that's associated with it. That's why it may sit in the annual reviews, and it's consistent with other other board areas. In terms of follow-up, um, another example is we've got um, waiting times and access issues. Um, the issues each year may be different, so the the item may be in the uh, annual review letter, but maybe a different issue that's causing that. What we then do is take that into our performance. So we've got weekly meetings in terms of access, in terms of our uh, ops group. That then flows through to our performance and resources committee who will scrutinise our action plans and what steps we're taking to, to address these. We will then have follow-up meetings with the access team at the Scottish Government. So that flows through. Okay, thank you. A, a, a tiny point in support of my colleagues. Um, it feels that the Scottish Government are really close to these areas and wider areas because there are emerging challenges and the risk profile will change across a range of things. So it feels very close. We also have a formal mid-year review um, and certainly through professional meetings, say with the chief nurse or the medical directors, key issues um, con concerning performance in relation to a whole range of things are also brought up in these areas and it would be the same with finance and certainly the chief executives um, meet um, monthly and there is a real rigorous process. Um, so it feels close so I think we take the responsibility as chairman's described but it does feel as if they're very closely um, alongside us in terms of we have to improve of course chairman said that in his opening remarks and then we do work hard across Scotland to learn from other boards or anyone who's best in class um, out with the Scottish Health Service um, and we've done lots of work across that whether it's safety and, and other areas so there's a kind of a very it feels as if they're scrutinizing and also there is improvement support from a range of agencies to make sure we're learning um, and preventing um, perhaps the same um, um, issues around performance. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Emma Harper wanted to ask some further questions around the SABS issue, which you've already okay. addressed, Emma. Thanks. Um, I, um, I will declare I'm at interest because I am a registered nurse who used to actually teach nurses how to reduce staph aureus bacteremias, line infections, cannula infections, all of that. So I am interested in the data because community acquired is obviously not related to sticking needles in people and things like that. But the data doesn't really reflect that. It just reports overall SAB rates. So I'm interested in whether the data needs to be um, delineated a bit more 
differently so that community acquired is separate from hospital acquired, but also what are you doing as far as learning from other boards, other clinical educators, other nurse educators, other infection control teams? Because there are folk doing better, although there are people that are doing worse as well. Pick it off, and my colleagues, um, I'm sure, because I think Andrew's already highlighted how close all of us are, whether we're clinical um, or non clinical. Um, I think we know that nationally they're looking at the, the target around SAVs just to try and make sure, because obviously it's calculated in the amount of occupied bed days, um, and obviously um, each of the systems are slightly different in relation to how they're beds or supporting patients in their communities. So we know nationally they're looking at that target and um, to make sure that it's doing what it what it needs to do. Regardless of that, we've always taken it really seriously and my colleagues have, have said that. We have our local data though of whether they are hospital acquired and we've, we've given you some of that or whether it's community acquired or healthcare acquired. So we have um, on a month by month breakdown which goes to the board as well as dedicated time around clinical governance and to the frontline team so we're really aligned around this from frontline to, to the NHS board. So we have the detail of when the last SAB was within hospital and what caused it. And we do a root cause analysis around that. And all of our staff are developed and trained around patient safety and including techniques like root cause analysis. So we're looking for how we might prevent that again. In terms of healthcare acquired and community acquired, we know whether that is um, coming from a, a, a drug using population or whether it's, it's, it's just happening in the community for various different reasons and we will know what that reason is so we're looking at it from an individual patient perspective so I think as a board um, we have got a ways to go We've, we're a wee bit um, off of the piece in terms of other boards um, but we know with real clarity and we know that we're not prevent we're not cross there's no cross infection um, what we have done around this is make sure that um, our staff and our patient and the public um, really feel any kind of infection control, as I described earlier, the seat is a touchstone of how well the board um, is performing. And what we have done is we work our infection control teams with our managers and with our clinical staff across the whole breadth of the clinical community work together on this. This is not seen as a management target or a piece. This is about patient care. Um, and therefore, all of the training and development happens at that level. And what we do have is uh, each of the wards and departments have very visible to patients and public and the staff the last time they've had an infection. Some of the wards and departments in Fourth Valley Royal, it's been over a year and sometimes even more. There recently the gynecology ward had been nearly three years since the last time that they had had a staph aureus bacteremia. So what we've got is action and support for the front line and from management and clinical leaders all the way to the board really, really cited um, on it. So the board are able to see where those infections have been and asking Andrew and I and the public health um, Director of Public Health, what are we doing about that? And then we report back on the actions. So it's a very, very tight um, sort of line, if you will, from board to the front line. And the actions, like, I mean, without getting into too much detail, are simply things like don't disconnect an IV unnecessarily and scrub the hub of the bioconnector and make sure it dries and all of that. So, so I'm assuming all of that is down at the coal phase detail. And, and that, these parts of um, the, the, the bits of plastic or the cannula that's popped into people on various things, they're part of the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, which the whole of Scotland um, has um, embraced. And we can see if there's any failures, which, which often tends to be documentation and not practice, um, we can see that at that granular level. And we can also see that per ward, per department, per directorate, or across the board. And we're able to drill down and see whether it was you know, a failure of a step, as you've described, um, or it was a failure of documentation. And if we find anything like that, again, we go in and support the staff. This is about continuous improvement. And we've shown pretty spectacular results. In fact, the recent um, uh, visit from the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, who were looking for patients with cannula, they couldn't find them to see if we had done the bundle, as you've described correctly, because actually we would never put any device in any patient unless they absolutely need it. And that's what Andrew described, because sometimes there's a small group of patients who are going to need incredibly invasive procedures and we need to make sure our staff are, are, are making sure there is no intent no unintentional harm um, and again I think we've performed really really well that's why it's really disappointing that we've not quite got to other boards and although we're only a little away and um, the amount of energy we've um, um, and our staff are really 
quite disappointed around it. But we do visit, and the Scottish Patient Safety Programme um, supports that, but we do visit other boards. Uh, anybody who's doing something different than us, we will go and try and learn and, and put it into our own context. Education, training and development. Even in tough times, that's something the board will never, ever um, not want to address. We are a board, and I'm sure you'll come on to our financial issues, but we are absolutely clear about keeping patients safe, supporting our staff, population health, as well as, as balancing our books, because without balancing our books, we can't care properly. OK, thank you. Thanks. That's that's helpful to our point. I mean, from what you're, you're, you've given very full answers in terms of the, the hands-on uh, actions at, at, at the ward level and, and a little bit about what you've done to learn from other boards, but, but I'm not sure I have heard something that tells me what you're doing this year is different from what you were doing last year and is more likely to deliver the targets that have been set again in the review. I wonder if there's an overview of, of that in this area. Could I say, we have to wait, all targets, you have to be careful. As uh, Angela said, it's calculated based on the the bed base, we have got a relatively small bed base relative to other hospitals, so our divisor is smaller. Most of the infections is community-based, the three categories, hospital, and I'm satisfied as chair that we've cracked up. We have the occasional case, and these are fully investigated, and any lessons are, are learned, but it's fairly minimal. The other two categories, healthcare and community, most of these are community-based, the health care, in my view, is erroneous. Somebody's been in, had any contact with a health service and they get an infection, it's automatically uh, classified as health care when the infection can be nothing to do with a health care treatment. Most of it's community. If the calculator was was community, was community total population, I think the figures, or comparative figures, would be a lot different. And, and, and that's why I make the point... We are doing a lot of our problem is with drug users. We're doing a lot of work with that. We've done a lot of work over the years in reducing that. And in these cases where it does happen, there's an outbreak, we investigate and we do what we can. But dealing with drug users is a difficult group and it is a, a moving group. So it is difficult to say exactly what we're going to do given that this group, you know, can actually change, but we still take it very, very seriously. But it, we're limited what we, we, we can do. That's what I'm saying. I think in terms of the way it's calculated just now and what we are doing as a board, it's difficult to see us, you know, substantially improving on our performance. And I say, if it was population-based, then I think our comparative figure would be a lot stronger than what it is when it's when it's bed-based. Emma, I think here's a quick follow-up. Why, why drug users are more difficult? Is it because they're finding veins in groins and places that aren't the place to decontaminate the skin in the best way or the fact they're not doing it in the first place? So uh, can I respond to you? I, I, I think we, it's, it's, a, it's a very vulnerable group who, who don't always um, take all the precautions that, that um, other people would. So, so people, say diabetics, who are injecting themselves would always prep the area properly with, with sterilisation. Um, I, I, we don't think that our, our IV drug abusing community, that those individuals would, would take those steps and reusing of needles, etc. So the, so the way that we try to work with that group is through, as I said, through our ADP, trying to improve accessibility to clean needles, um, uh, ease of, of uh, disposal of, of equipment. So, so we recognise it, and, but it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult group because of those vulnerabilities to be able to reach out to in, in a consistent and meaningful way. And as, as uh, Chair said, uh, that, that group you know, will, will be a different group from five years ago. So, so it's, a, it's a constant uh, process to try and engage with them. But we've got some, some really, uh, for me, um, relatively new into Fort Valley, we've, we've worked really strongly with, with our uh, addiction community. We've got some really good examples through our public health services. So we are um, really trying to make sure that, that that group is is not uh, is, is not left as vulnerable, and they get the support they need. Thanks. I, we move on. I think to one of the other areas of of uh, action points uh, I highlighted, which was around access targets and standards, in particular, uh, child and adolescent mental health services and psychological therapies. I think uh, Alex. Colham didn't have yes, a question. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning to the panel. Thank you for coming to see us today. Um, 
I was very struck by your CAMS compliance uh, reporting. I mean, you've gone from being one of the best performing health boards in the country in a matter of months to becoming one of the worst performing uh, health boards in the country. I understand that's uh, about staffing pressures, but can you explain exactly what's happened? Because to go from 100% to below 50% in just three months seems like a a considerable dive and and is is that entirely about staffing problems is there light at the end of the tunnel please uh, bottom that out for us i can perhaps pick pick that one up um it has been almost entirely staffing uh, issues in cams it's slightly different in psychological therapies so in cams we've had a range of a few staffing vacancies which are filled now and will be coming into post over the next couple of months it came at the same time as we had some specific sickness issues and some maternity leave given the size of the service it was around a 10 12 percent difference in staffing that we actually had at any point in time and the remaining staff have then had to pick up the ongoing cases that were already in these people's caseload. Um, the staff are coming back, obviously maternity leave comes to an end, a number of the staff who've been in sick leave are coming back and we've got the vacancies um, filled um, and with all these coming into place and nothing else happening we're looking at probably a June time frame to get us back to where we were. So I think it, we would see it as a temporary blip, but obviously that doesn't help in terms of the patients, etc. Well, that's gratifying to hear. Um, but in terms of your risk and resilience planning, I mean, people go on maternity leave all the time and, and obviously people fall ill all the time. So um, were you content that your processes and your plans uh, were uh, ready for this blip? Um, and how can we learn from it so that we, it doesn't occur again? I think um, it probably spiked. It was almost like, yes, you would always have these, these issues to face, but I think we probably had a number of them all coming together at the one time. Normally, there would be a little bit more spread over the year or over the, the, the system. In terms of resilience, I think we need to work with some of the other boards to see how we can help do that. We do try, so we speak to other people to see if we can get some additional capacity in to help cover um, for these particular instances. And I think that across a range of issues, not just CAMS, that's where some of the regional work may, may come to uh, to help us as well, to give us a little bit more resilience in terms of the size of our system uh, and staffing levels. That's probably where we could get some help. I, I'm grateful for that. And I think on that, I'd like to explore the fact that whilst this these statistics really only show us what's not being met, as in the 18-week target and those uh, young people not getting access to that 18 uh, services within that 18-week target, what it doesn't show is the kind of maximum worst-case scenario weight that some of these young people are going to experience. And that is obviously our chief concern here. Um, in that respect what additional resource can you buy in from other health boards um, how can we get these young people seen in a reasonable time beyond the weight they've already had to endure to pick up broadly across cams and psychological therapies our weights the longest weights are not the longest that you would see across we've tried to even though we're not hitting the target our weights aren't lengthy beyond the period that you that you see sitting there. I think um, we've been also working, and just to give some examples, um, particularly with um, uh, the in CAMS with the parents. We've set up a parents group very specifically to see what additional support you may be able to bring in and also to give a wider support to the family network. We heard very clearly um, actually at our annual review in terms of the patient uh, uh, session just the impact uh, that CAMS and um, living with a, a child with mental health issues has on the wider family. So I think the parents group is a really strong support and we've had real help from the Scottish Health Council to, to help set that up. Uh, in terms of getting support from the regional network, I think it's a bit about resilience because everybody's facing some of these issues at any point in time and it may be when we're at 100% somebody will come to us and ask for the same thing. So I think it's just about us broadly doing some of the capacity planning across that. And final question, if I may convene it, um, I'm keen to know also, across the four tiers of CAMS provision, is this delay in treatment experienced right across the board, or is it particularly focused at tier one or tier four, or how, how is the profile? It's particularly, at, it's particularly at tier one, because one of the areas that we are focused on is what we would call between tier three, tier four, and it's part of the learning for, from other systems, is to put a focus there so that we're preventing um, young people having to spend any time 
or, or minimise any time they may have to have in an inpatient facility. So we've been focusing quite a lot of effort there to make sure that we don't have, have that, the, the weights are really in the tier one, tier two. Thank you, convener. Thank you. It's striking that, uh, as well as the maternity leave and staff issues that, that you mentioned in reply to Alice Cole Hamilton, there's also an issue around an increase in referrals in the period uh, under review. Is that a trend you anticipate continuing? Is, there a, is that a spike or if, is it a trend? If I can just pick up in terms of child and adolescence, it's not been so much of an issue there. Pretty much what we plan for is what we've been seeing. There may be some variability across the system. Um, more where we've had real challenges and increased referral has been in psychological therapies. It really has increased dramatically. Um, we've seen, we're not hitting the target, but we've actually seen 13% more new patients and our returns and follow-up treatment program is an increase in 17 percent um so it's been what we planned for um where an average of 375 referrals and what's actually coming in is 484. it's varied across the system so some of the um what we're trying to do and again some learning from other places was to put some support in and we're looking at this at the moment into more of the primary care setting to look at why there's variability across practices which is causing some of the increase in in referrals um, so there's some work that we're linking with Dumfries and Galloway who I think have piloted some of this um, so it's the, the increase in referrals is predominantly psychological therapies yeah, please. Convener, thank you. Thank you for letting me come back in. Um, in that vein, uh, what efforts are the health board and indeed the local authority employing to sort of prevent young people needing access to tier one support? Is there an early intervention programme um, within Forth Valley? It's one of the priorities areas in terms of children around our health improvement strategy and we've got clear links across both social care and education and um, we've got some really good examples in the health improvement strategy of work particularly in the Falkirk area around some of the secondary school and just the mental health and well-being of secondary school children you get the various stresses and strains that they go through it through as teenagers so there's a lot of joint work with the local authorities and it's a clear community planning priority across the area can i just add a little bit of detail i mean we are the only health board that's offering free mental health and um, first aid training we describe it so that anyone can access that and um, there's some very active programs within the schools um, and and we're closely partnered with um, fort valley college around some of this as well and there's a a, a very um, impressive initiative which um is, is in Fourth Valley, which is called Max in the Middle, which is again about building resilience in younger school children as well, and it includes mental health and all sorts of other aspects, and that eval evaluates very highly. So I think we've got a really strong programme in that regard. Okay. Thank you. Th thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, cancer is another area where there is a, an issue around uh, achieving standards, and I wonder if you would like to comment on that, in particular um, on the regional arrangements and planning arrangements and how all of those impact upon meeting those targets? Um, our, our, um, our cancer performance in terms of achieving the 60-day uh, target to, to, to treatment is, uh, is an area of, of focus for us and we recognise that's, um, to come out to Chairman's opening statements, that's, uh, that is an area where we, where, where we need to um, uh, improve. We have... Um, seen through uh, we look at all the data on a, on a monthly basis and we um, compare health board performance and so we can see other where, where other uh, uh, surrounding health boards have um, have demonstrated better um, performance and so we contribute to what's called the regional cancer advisory group we, we are we're active members there and that's where the regional um, uh, teams get together to com to compare as well and to, and to see what what is best practice and agree what best practice is. There's also clinical leads who who meet to, to agree what best practice is and what the best pathway would therefore be for patients. So there is um, a structure which allows the sharing of of that best practice. Um, from our perspective, we have a, a new clinical lead for for cancer who is now actively in over the next two or three months will go around every single cancer pathway and suggest improvements and and we're using that regional benchmarking if you like to to advise what what ours should be 
Um, we're particularly looking at Lanarkshire's performance um, and seeing how, how, how they've managed to, to achieve what they can and then what we can replicate locally. And we're already seeing some improvements, um, particularly around one of our um, uh, first pathways that we've looked at. We, we've been able to put in a little bit more resource, which is going to um, improve the urology pathway for, for, for men. Um, and we, we, so we expect to see that side of uh, the performance improving. So, so overall, we, when you look at the cancer breakdown, uh, the, the cancer target breakdown, there are the two parts. There's 62 days, which is, as you said, is about regional and tertiary treatments, and then there's a 31-day part, which is often seen as more for the local health board to be able to, to do as slickly as possible. Because the key thing in all this is, uh, you know, obviously, my, my clinical background was in the management of, of people with suspected cancer or, uh, and then through to their treatment. So it's, it's absolutely, it's that weight, it's that uncertainty of not knowing when you've got symptoms and, and making sure that, that part of your um, journey is as short as possible so you get the answers you need to allow you to then um, uh, engage with the, the clinical team. So, so we are very, um, we're, we're aware of where we need to, to improve. Um, we have seen our referrals go up in, in cancer um, pathways from roughly 1,000 a month to 1,400 a month. So we have seen quite a strain on our system, but as I said, I now have, we now have a new clinical lead who's going to be going through all the pathways, and uh, my expectation is over the next two or three months we will have a refresh programme there which will, will demonstrate best practice and bring us um, up to where we want to be. Thanks very much. Is it fair to say that there's a, uh, is there a wider pattern of increased referrals from primary care into the acute sector in Forth Valley? I think it's, it's very dependent on the on the specialties. Uh, I would say I don't think it's definitely across the board, but the you know we would. I think when we look at our overall figures, I'm linked to Fiona to see if she's got any data on that. Um, but the, the the feel is that our GP colleagues um, know what specialist input can bring. They know, they know the tests that that, that can um, provide and. You know, there's a, there's a whole expectation thing as well, not just from primary care, but from 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 the public. Um, so, when we're looking at our data, Fiona, do you know the, the most up to date? To say, papers? I think it, it does vary across the specialties. Um, some, particularly, obviously, with demographic change, um, have been hit particularly where you've got obviously some things like ophthalmology, orthopaedics, etc. There definitely have been increases, particularly orthopaedics, in terms of trauma. Um, um, certainly over this year. Uh, it does vary by specialty. Some others, we're not seeing that. Yes. I think in relation, just going back to Andrew's point about cancer, I think the government's programme around detect cancer early and really targeting groups. So it's not just about GPs being very observant about what they're being presented with. The public are now very aware, thankfully, of symptoms and they're actually putting themselves forward. So I think that referral um, pattern that we're seeing will probably increase and that's about raising awareness and it's about how we then in terms of diagnostic rule out or, or move people through the pathway to treat and whilst there might be an increase I think that's a really good thing if we can catch these these illnesses quite early and make an intervention we know that if we do that the outcomes are greatly improved for for our patients yes so in terms of the meeting the 62 day target where we don't meet it, we don't miss it by much. It's literally a small period, and it's all related to treatments. As Andrew said, we're looking at all our pathways. So it is about trying to take you know, a few days of some of the actual treatments so that we can get all our ca cases within the 62 days. It's not a major issue. And we've always been driven by making sure people get the best treatment and carrying out the appropriate tests. And the tests that we can carry out as a board have improved greatly over the years through developments, medical science. So we've not got a major problem to resolve, but we, our intention is you not know, to try and hit the actual target. And hopefully the work that we're actually doing will address that. Okay, thank you very much for a number of colleagues who wanted to ask around the position with delayed discharge. Uh, perhaps start with uh, Sandra. Thank, thank you very much, Convener, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for getting in this morning with the weather. The weather's so bad. Um, Mr. Linkston, in your opening remarks, you mentioned the fact that uh, some areas need improved, and I note, uh, obviously, delayed discharge and unscheduled care. 
has, has risen uh, quite a bit, actually. Uh, could you perhaps give us some explanation for that? Yeah, well, I'll bring my colleague Sean in. I, I will take that because uh, delayed discharge is, is something that's a multi-factorial, multidisciplinary and multi-service area. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that there's considerable variation in uh, delayed discharge figures ac across the piece, both in, in the mainstream of delayed discharges, but also in, in what would be referred to as the Code Nines or the more specialist areas of guardianship. Um, I think when, when you look at our figures, um, we have had some deterioration. Um, it is not a consistent deterioration, though, when you look over the last one to two years. You, you can see general downward trends in most of it. Um, we do have peak periods, and we do work to anticipate those peak periods, both through winter planning, but in general through the day-to-day -day planning. So we're, do, we're doing a great deal of work. So, for example, we, we've done work, certainly, um, across Clip Manager and Stirling on guardianships, because we, we do have quite a high level of guardianship in our area, um, and we have carried out reviews of all of the guardianships. We have taken advice from the Mental Welfare Commission. We've worked um, with Greater Glasgow Health Board, who have some specialist input in terms of, of just retraining and refocusing, um, particularly our uh, mental health officers, on, on the way that you would handle uh, guardianships, given that the legislation and the practice tends to move quite a bit. So they, they were using quite a traditional method and not using 13ZA, which is a way of, of if somebody is able to either not consent themselves, but there's a clear impetus and a clear statement, um, a pre-existing statement about a desire and a clear agreement both with clinicians and with families, people can move to alternative placements. And we weren't using those um, as well as, as we should have. Been. So we are now seeing that that uh, number de um, declining um, and being managed very very tightly on a kind of day to day basis. To, to give you some kind of um, assurance, really, about the work that's going on, we have weekly calls in place that are supported by the chief executive. Um, and that involves all of all of the senior members of staff, including most of the panel that you see here. And we review our activity, any issues that have arisen, any things that we, we really need to go in and sort very, very quickly. Those are supported by senior management team steering groups, which again meet absolutely every single week and review and flag up. On a daily basis, I check our delayed discharges. And if you were talking to any of my staff, they would tell you that I'm on the phone the minute I see any kind of variation or I don't like the look of something or I want to just query um, and we are working very very hard to, to just keep up with all of that and um, we've got multidisciplinary daily huddles in place so social care staff third sector providers um, clinical staff etc on the ground in the hospitals every day reviewing who is, is delayed in discharge, but also who's coming through the system. And, and we are needing to do a little bit more work on that, but I think we are getting a lot better um, understanding those people who are likely to be delayed as we move forward. Um, and those are the people who tend to be pretty complex. So if you look now at, at the delayed discharge figures, both in Falkirk and in Clipman and Sean Sterling, you will see that the people who are delayed are those who have a degree of complexity. It's not straightforward. There are family issues, there are sometimes accommodation issues, there are frequently uh, mental capacity issues or other things that are causing the delay. But it certainly is worked on very, very heavily. Um, we are also working um, just now on our frailty pathway. And that's one of the areas that we know as a board that we, we can do some improvement work on and around. And we've got IHUB involved in that, who are the, the Improvement Support Service. In terms of commissioning, um, both integration um, authorities have looked at commissioning and we have recommissioned some of the care at home services. Some of them are currently under contract, so Stirling's won't be due for renewal until later this year. Um, but we, we have done in Falkirk, we have commissioned, jointly commissioned um, a, a new provider um, with a focus on discharge to assess. Um, and that has made a huge difference in terms of the, the, the Falkirk services. Um, in Clipman and Sharon Stirling, we have rebadged ours as, as a quick step to be very clear with staff, with providers, that we're expecting a very quick hour to two hour response, not a day to two day response. And that has made a huge difference. Um, we have also um, initiated really a home first approach. So when we're, we're talking to families, clinicians and others, we are talking about people going home. The focus is on going home, not remaining in hospital, not moving to other hospitals and not moving to long term care. The focus, other than those who absolutely need to do, the focus is very much as, as patients 
would, would tell you it's about going home. That's that's what most people want to do in mm -hmm. a supported way. And we, we have um, really, over the last year, year and a half, worked much more strongly with providers. We've established provider forums. Um, the strategic planning group itself also monitors. There's a strategic planning group, which is a multi-agency group that patients, carers, service users, etc., are also part of, um, also monitor um, our, our performance in and around discharges and support us with, with direct feedback um, from service user and carer experience. So there's, there's a clear feedback loop going into the system. Chair, could I just come back in? Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that. I mean, the evidence we've been given is awaiting place availability, um, completion of care arrangements, you'd mentioned that yourself, and assessments also. And there has been some criticism in regard to the fact that since the integration joint boards were established, uh, there has I'm not saying blaming the integration joint boards, uh, but basically the evidence you've given there is that things have improved with the integration joint boards yes. and not the opposite, that the increase in delayed discharge and unplanned bed days uh, just happen to coincide with the integration joint boards. So as a panel or, or yourself, um, would you say it has actually improved and given benefits uh, to the, the situation. I, I think I probably should should um, just highlight for a, for you a specific issue that we have just now. We have a number of care home issues, so some some of the delays are relating to care home availability. We um, were quite badly affected by the fire in uh, the, the Fife care home, which borders on the Concarden area, and both Falkirk, Clitmanager and Stirling had had a great number of patients um, in, in these care homes. So that, that has had quite a knock-on effect because both Fife and ourselves have had to absorb the people who've been displaced um, through that process. The other the other issues that we have is, is that we have a, a care home closure being flagged um, by one of the providers and we have a moratorium in place in one of the very, very large care homes. And we are working very closely uh, with, with the both providers, but particularly with the moratorium in place um, to improve those services. And we are doing that with, with nursing staff um, from NHS Forth Valley in, in, and working with providers. And I think that kind of gives you an indication of the improvement that you can have. It's much more of a multidisciplinary approach and it's much more of a shared what, what are we going to do in order to make this, this improve, make it better. And that also includes the, the work with the providers and the stakeholders. Thank you. Just a small one. Uh, thank you very much for that. That certainly clarifies for myself and others exactly from the evidence we've given and from the evidence you've given also. But I'm really, you know, quite pleased that you mentioned, obviously, the, the, the tragic situation with the care homes, but also the long term uh, with care homes. I presume it's Beale that's closing in, 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 in your area, which we took evidence a, a couple of weeks ago at the Health Committee. And it seems to be that may be the pattern uh, going forward. So would you say that we, in your situation in the health board, you find it more difficult to place people uh, in care homes if they continue along this pattern of, you know, closing? So what you're seeing with Beald and a number of others, is that the care homes are very small and they are financially quite challenging. They're also challenging in terms of staffing and the people who are now resident in care homes, even at residential level, um, require very, very high levels of care. So it's, it's not the way it was maybe five, six years ago where people were still, if you were reasonably ambulatory, you, you, you could go into a residential care home. I would say there's, there's probably very little difference between residential care now and nursing care. And some of the work that we are doing um, and the board is just about, the integration joint board is just about to consider, we have some very small care homes. It's about how you use those care homes to best effect. So in, in Clipmanager and Stirling, we have, we have used those for intermediate care beds to support rehabilitation, um, to support people getting back up on their, their feet um, and a kind of period of convalescence if you like and we have a 35 million pound investment in uh, Stirling Care Village uh, which will include both uh, the, the current residential and intermediate care facilities uh, across uh, the, the Stirling area of Clip Manager and Stirling and includes some of the community hospital facilities. So we are investing. We are also, um, we have a market position statement that we developed with providers um, and we are currently working uh, through our commissioning strategy 
um, and there will be some tendering activity um, probably uh, in the next 12 months in terms of both care homes and in terms of extra care housing and we're currently working with the local authority housing providers um, in terms of extra care housing and that, that's particularly pertinent in Click Manager. Thank you. Thank you. I know I've veered off a wee bit, but thank you very much. No, that. that's, that's, that's helpful. Uh, Ivan, did you have a question yeah. in this area as well? Um, explore. Thanks, convener, and thanks, uh, panel, for coming along this morning. Yeah, just um, drill a wee bit more detail on the delayed discharges. There's some numbers in there that says you've had about 33,000 bed days, I think, and uh, in, in your paper you talk about the number of specific cases, which I think is about 66 at the moment, but it's been up or down 40, 80, and that kind of range. Um, just to put that in context, how many acute beds are we talking about in the health board? So in terms of acute beds, so we have only one site, which is Fourth Valley Royal Hospital, and uh, when we when we designed the models around that, we designed the models so that urgent patients and patients requiring elective uh, were able to be seen equally, so one wouldn't um, sort of uh, uh, gazump the other, if you will. Um, so we talk about bed numbers and we talk about spaces because we have lots of spaces of where for 23-hour day surgery and things. So, so our bed number varies slightly, but it's probably just um, my colleagues will probably all watch so about 650, um, and then obviously um, working with our health and social care partners, but we also flex our accommodation um, during winter or any other need for, for, for you know, community. We're talking about, give or take, 10% of them are tied up in delayed discharges of one type or the other. What kind of average day are we talking about for those delayed discharges? Are they typically two or three days or two or three months or, or kind of where are we in that range? Do you have that data? Equipment manager in Stirling, it, it tends to be for the majority of uh, delays. It's, it's under the four weeks. Um, so we are we are performing within our partnership. Um, we are not hitting the target. So I don't want you to think that I'm, I'm minimising that. We are working towards that. But we are, if we look at ourselves in comparative authorities, we are performing very well. So so we perform better than other comparator partnerships. And we perform better than the yeah. Scottish average. Yeah, so there aren't many that are there for a long time. No, those those right. that tend to be there are highly complex uh, code nines. Do you know how many of those you have? Um, not off the top of my right. head at the moment, but I, I but can you're saying that the, the vast majority it's, it's are, a, it's a are moving. It's right. a, it's so an absolute handful. That's good in the sense that what that says is you've got churn, you've got more people coming in, but those people aren't staying very long. You're finding a route out for them. It's not as if you've got a huge number of that sixty odds that are stuck no. for a long, long time. Across Fourth Valley, we have a low, a low stay rate. Right, so that that's good, and that's um, maintained. So, so then moving on to the, the the downstream part of this, if you compare the costs, I mean, what kind of numbers do you use for a, an, an acute bed night? What kind of cost number do you have for that? Mm, that's a good question. Thank you. So, uh, so we, so we pay £300, okay, pounds okay, right, a night. okay. And how much do you pay for a care home bed? A care home is um, 656, I think, just a now, week. national care home contract. A week. So we're talking about somewhere between £800 to stay in an acute hospital versus £100 a night to be in the care home. There's, so some, there's some variations in sure. that. We have some very sure. small care homes yeah. um, who are over £1,000 a week. So we a have week, some, not a day. Yeah, we, so we have, but right. it's, not, it's not in the same. Right. Absolutely. Okay, so just to get that in context, so clearly the integration process was supposed to fix that problem whereby the money would flow and you would be able to realise the gains in the acute sector by spending a very, very small fraction of that in the, the care home sector. So you kind of talked earlier about care home capacity. Um, so is that the main block that stops you moving those 60-odd people out of the acute sector today? We have a, a temporary situation um, in our partnership with the moratorium in place in terms of care standards. We are expecting uh, there to be sustained improvement. So we're in a period of monitoring sustained improvement at the moment and we'll review again at the end of January. It won't, it won't take all of the people. There, there are a few. Um, there are six people in our partnership who have highly complex needs who require specialist placements. So they are, they are on the delayed discharge list because yeah. they, they are clinically ready That's for it. discharge, uh, but they have special codes because of the the level of complexity. Right. So just supposing we made that wave the magic wand today and you had unlimited care home capacity in the area, you're saying that practically all of those people, apart from a handful, could be moved out of the acute system? 
majority could be moved, I think. Right. There are okay. some that are waiting, though. You, you need to be careful because there are some waiting for guardianships. Yeah, I um, so I was and to there's understand a legal process around the guardianship. But you're telling me that's a small number mm. in the scheme of no, things. No, there's a small number of highly complex cases. Right. Okay. And, and there are the majority in Clipmanage and Stirling yeah. are in relation to guardianships. The majority that you're now seeing on mm -hmm. our delayed discharge are guardianship situations. Right, so back to the start, that's why so, I would so you would, you would try need to break that there's down There's a court process that's followed there. I understand all of that. That's how I was trying to understand board. what the breakup of your 66 yeah. was. So going back to the start, of your 66, how many are complex cases and how many are guardianship or Code 9 cases? So in Clipmanage, the very complex um, are five to six cases at the moment, so a very small percentage. Yeah. The vast bulk are guardianship for us. I spoke our guardianship. Our guardianship, right. our complex And you cases. said that the majority of those you are moving through in less than four weeks? The, 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 the majority of our o overall delayed discharges move through in the less than four weeks. Mm -hmm. the, the, the grouping that you're seeing here are the grouping who are delayed in their discharge are those who have guardianship or more complex needs. No, I'm, I'm right. I need to clarify here. Um, at the start, we talked about there was about 60 odd people there, and I said, of your delayed discharges, how long are they staying? Maybe I wasn't clear, but what I meant was, how long are they staying beyond the point at which they should move out? I um, if I'm right, not okay. Being clear so the question response. was, of the, 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 the 60 odd people that are. The, you know, once somebody is available for discharge, right, and they are then technically delayed discharge, how long are they in that delayed discharge process for? So we will use some of the community hospital beds for, for some of these people too, um, in terms of, of freeing up the absolute acute, but they are still within, and they legally require to be within an NHS system. So, so how long are people um, stuck in the system Guardianship for? can take up to three months. It will depend on how fast the private guardianships right. are particularly okay. problematic. Okay. And Stirling has quite a high level of private guardianship. So going back to the question I was asking, if you waived the magic wand, you had unlimited care home capacity, of those 66, how many could you move out tomorrow and how many are stuck waiting for guardianship I issues? Think I think the last time I looked at the figures, which is relatively <laughs> like yesterday, I thought it was a, a, almost a 50-50 split. Yeah. So you want to so right, okay. So half of them could go uh, if there was yes, care. Yes. And so then you've got two problems. You've got a problem, how do you streamline the guardianship process, which is quite involved in a, a legal process, but it could maybe be looked at at a, a micro level. But then there's the issue around about the care home capacity. Um, now, why are there not enough care homes in the system? Is there a cost issue there? Is there a false economy that says we could save a thousand pound a day, but we're not doing that because we're not willing to spend more than a hundred pound a day? I think that we have to think about our whole system, and I know that you're looking for this point in time. But one of the things about integration is about that whole pathway. We know that if we can have early intervention, particularly with older people, we actually slow that process down. Um, older people want to be at home but they, they want to be at home with support uh, and care. And I think one of the things that we've been challenged on in relation to that is that whole notion of isolation. It's fine being at home, but unless you have other things to spend your day with, um, um, we, we have to think about that. So as a partnership, I think we will be looking to, we've started that um, by moving our front door to you know, in front of our front door in, in the emergency department for those people coming into our system, particularly our older population, our frail, elderly. We're actually saying to our social work colleagues who know these people, can we take these people back home with support, with an intensive package, as opposed to coming into our hospital? So I think we've got work to do right across the pathway. To do that care at home cost? That care at home will be relatively less, but I will look to colleagues who know the Fourth Valley mm. situation. So we, we've got a number of providers who actually come in and take that, take those patients home. Looking at the figures as the new person, I think we've been doing kind of intensive four visits, but very quickly people get on their feet. We put in additional support in terms of less support, so to speak, and that, that trails off. But Shona, you'll have the figures to hand. So, so. The, the, the care at home again varies depending on who's providing it. So the upper the upper level would be um, somewhere between 35 to 42 pounds. Yeah. And those tend to be internally provided services by the local 35 authorities. 35 to 42 pounds per, per hour. Per hour and per hour per one worker. So some right. of the people who are being discharged require two workers. Right. So on a daily cost, then that depending on how long they're in for. Yeah. That so, could be so to get to a residential or a nursing home care level, you would have to provide circa thirty-five hours a week 
in right, somebody's okay. own care home. Okay, so again, that brings that level. you. So that, that would be the level that we use as a rule of thumb. That brings you back to just about a thousand pound a week yes, kind of number. Uh, so again, roughly. it's a long, long, long way away from the acute. Because if you look at that a macro level, thirty three and a half thousand delayed discharge days last year, you're saying it's between eight hundred and a thousand pound per per day. So that brings you uh, twenty five to thirty million pound a year kind of number. Um so that's the kind of eyes on the prize, but there's clearly some kind of log jam happening here and we're trying to build in and understand that. Um, and if there's not enough people coming into the care home market because you're scrimping and saving at that end um, and missing the big prize, um, I, I don't know if that's the issue, but certainly when I talk to care home people, they're saying if we had a very slight amount more, we could open up more capacity and you're kind of cutting your nose off to spite your face. I don't know if that's a scenario, but certainly from the outside, it kind of sort of looks like that. I don't know if you want to comment on that. We're also doing some additional work um, on models of neighbourhood care, which is a, a Burtsog um, type system. Um, and we have a pilot in one of the rural areas because Stirling also has a huge rural hinterland where the population is very spread out. So we're, we're not looking at an urbanised area. Yeah, and I understand I, and that, I mean, and there's lots of solutions to that. So, so there are lots of solutions that we're working our way through in, in terms of both the front door and the frailty work and the models of care. But all of them come in at a fraction of the cost. They all do, yes. Can I just maybe comment a couple sure. of things, because yeah. I think it's already been highlighted. The majority of our delays are not sitting in our acute system. They're sitting in our community hospital beds, and we want to change the model that we're actually using there. So I don't think that that would be a much lower cost that we're yeah. talking about. What kind of number is that? Uh, talking about there. I'm sorry, I can't yeah. remember off yeah. the top of my head, but it's much lower than, because we've tried to keep the acute sure. system sure. clear of, the, of yeah. that. The other thing to take into account is frees up that bit, but it's also the bit about we've got across the system, we've got to take account of the demographic change and the impact so it's not as straightforward as just you free up that bit because there's more just because of the demand yeah, I know it's not as simple as that right but I mean at a macro level it is as simple as that I know there's a lot of work to be done on it but I think it's important not to lose focus on it at a macro level as well I've raises that I suspect will be for government rather than for the board to, to answer, but we'll no doubt have the opportunity to pursue pursue those questions. One point that uh, I'm aware of is that the numbers, the costs that you indicated for a night in hospital are perhaps uh, higher than we've uh, had indicated from other sources within the Scottish Health Service. We may uh, ask you further about that uh, later uh, when we write to you after, after the meeting. Um, that we are not a highly cost of, we are a highly cost effective system so I'm, I'm not conscious we are out with uh, sure. no, uh, any normal parameters we'll clarify understood. the we'll, detail we'll, we'll, we'll come to the, the uh, cost efficiency question in just a moment but um, that, that point will return to Miles I think you had one quick um, question thank then. you convener and good morning uh, to the panel I wanted to look specifically over the last few weeks um, when pressures obviously have been um, at their height and wondered about the number of cancelled planned operations within your health board, if you had a figure for that and what was meant to be taking place. Uh, I can say to the 15th of January, we've had 19 cancellations. When we compare that with last year, it was 22 for that same period. That's useful, thank you. And I'm kind of going off, off course here. Um, in terms of um, a point you raised earlier about the number of drug and alcohol um, people you have within your health board area you're um, looking after, what I wondered, the government's cut to alcohol and drug partnership funding. Did the health board meet that? Because the new person coming in, I was really impressed by the board's priority around that. They actually didn't um, make a reduction in that. They actually saw that as a priority, and all boards will determine what their priorities are. So from my memory, we continue to put in about £5.6 million into the partnership to actually support people in a very robust recovery programme. Um, so I think there's, there's huge lessons for other boards from the work in Forth Valley. I, I've been very struck by how impressive that is. And, and just the staff newsletter I was reading kind of my way in, you know, about people actually, people who have been previous um, substance misusing um, people who have actually set up cafes and they're actually trying to get into worthwhile employment. So for me, that, that that's a really good news story. It's really powerful. Um, and 
the short, we haven't we haven't reduced the the funding into to the partnership. Yeah. I think we're just about to open our fourth recovery cafe. Yes. So we've got three, and um, and again, these are there are people that encourage other people both in support and and back into uh, work and and an active community. So we're really quite proud of of that work. Yeah. And do you, do you keep figures on um, referral times for people seeking that as well? Specifically, do you have any data on that which you could provide? The committee. I don't have it to hand. Yeah. We, we, we meet all the targets. We've been at 100% for meeting that, and we have been for some time. And looking at um, population-wide, some of the, the challenges you face, and um, one of the things which I, as a Lothian MSP, um, find quite interesting is some of the referrals into NHS Lothian for treatment, and also where you lie, you're between Edinburgh and Glasgow in terms of um, using additional capacity within NHS Scotland. How's your experience of that, especially given um, the figures around the 62-day um, wait, which you've recorded, which is 64%, um, do you find capacity isn't available out with your health board area? That's why you're sitting at that level. Clarify, sorry, could I just clarify the, the pathway you're referring to there? Um, the referral, um, urgent referral for treatment. So within 62 days. So is that, is that, our, is that the cancer suspected? Yeah. That we're referring to? Um, so the, the, the way the services are structured, we, we will have specialists within our own um, complement of, of teams, but, but there will be, just because of the, the, the rarity of, of some of the presentations, it will mean that we do need to work um, uh, with, with regional teams and with tertiary teams. Um, and, and we have good links, primarily to the West. I think most of our patients are referred to, to um, colleagues within the West region but but we have um again with sort of very specialized areas where we know we're going to get the best treatment for our patients essentially and um, we will we will use those pathways um which will take some patients to the east but that's not because of a lack of our uh, resources just because of the specialized nature of those one of your submission states that some of this relates to local capacity issues so i wondered what they were then for you. That, that probably rewinds in some of the earlier discussions about what what's within our gift within that referral pathway to, to be able to, to fix so that's why we're reviewing all the pathways reviewing all the steps in them but ultimately you've got the pathway is of course from symptoms to somebody being going through test a diagnosis and it's only once you get the diagnosis that you then would know that actually that, that person then needs to be referred out with the area to, to a specialised team. What we can do within our service though is absolutely as you say is, is, is optimise that, that earlier part of it. If I may just give an additional example around there's, there's benefits and disbenefits, but the benefits of where we geographically sit, we've been able, um, we've had uh, particular challenges around radiology recruitment, but we've been working jointly with Lanarkshire to make sure, for example, the breast cancer pathway has continued to be met because you need the radiologist and the uh, consultant surgeon there at the same time, and Lanarkshire have been very supportive to help us keep that um, as a high priority and keep the pathway running for that. Relationships. Um, uh, given that we are this pretty bit in the middle between Edinburgh and Glasgow, we do find the relationships across, whether it's regional networks or individual services to services, the clinicians have fantastic relationships. Um, and we always find our colleagues, if we've got needs for our patients, which are sometimes having a delay, um, our other board colleagues who've got their own patients to see are incredibly supportive and understanding. We do have to work really hard to make sure that in seeing our patients, we don't knock the board off who have got the specialist uh, colleagues there. But again, that works really well both at clinical and at managerial level and if we do get challenges we will raise it um, you know with an exec or the chief exec would have a conversation and to try and get the best for both sets of patients so that happens on a day-to-day -day basis at different levels they're incredibly collegiate people do incredible things to care for our patients um, and that's the relationships that that we have and we're all building different types of relationships with regional and and some national planning some of our patients will need to be seen in a very national basis as Andrew's described. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I, if we can now move on to the issue of efficiency savings and the financial targets that have been set for you within the review, I wonder if Alison Johnson would like to start. Thank you, and good morning. Um, Audit Scotland's latest report on Forth Valley estimates that efficiency savings of 24 to 25 million are required um, for the next three years to meet your financial targets and that 10 to 12 million are at risk of not being delivered. And I believe your own board indicate that £6 million of savings will have to be met from non-recurrent sources. Um, I would be grateful if you could explain how you plan to achieve those targets and what impact do you think those savings might have on services? 
Uh, if I can pick up, yes, we've 24 million savings in the current financial year, and you're quite right, we have about six million pounds of that. Um, that um, we will be covering by non-recurrent means. It is becoming increasingly challenging around um, um, finding additional savings. I think all uh, in common with most boards, all the traditional routes have been, we continue to pursue them, but with diminishing returns around that. Um, the figure for next year is probably going to be slightly lower than we had originally estimated. Um, and so we're looking at the moment um, around uh, about 18 million. Um, and I think of that, six, that includes the 6 million that we've carried carried forward on. A, uh, so we always plan to make sure that we've covered. It is incredibly important that we continue to um, have sustainable uh, financial position. And this is really the the last couple of years is the first time we've hit challenges around recurrent savings. Areas that we are looking at is continuing to look at where we've got variability um, and looking at the big spend areas. So you will hear, and I guess in common with other areas, that we look around our prescribing efficiency. We did make significant uh, improvements um, a few years ago around um, primary care prescribing, where we used to be one of the highest. And we looked at other systems and what we were doing, and we're now, I think, in the third uh, the third lowest in terms of cost per head spend. We still have some areas that we can go for there. Um, we could look across um, uh, in terms of um, energy savings and things like that. We've still definitely got some areas that we can go for, for there, but that won't address everything. I think a lot that we are going to have to do and look at across the next couple of years is around the implementation of our uh, clinical services review and our healthcare strategy to actually drive some of the costs out through that route. Um, so it yeah. will it will remain challenging. Yeah, I'd like to learn a little bit more about what those non-recurrent um, savings will be. And you know, you point out yourself last year was the first year you were unable to to meet that target, which speaks to the demand and the challenges that are faced. I mean, do you think, given the many challenges Fourth Valley and other health boards are facing, that it's largely possible to achieve these savings. I mean, you are delivering demand-led services and that demand is increasing. I mean, do you think you've got 25 million pounds off? Can you become 25 million pounds more efficient without impacting on the services you're able to deliver? And I think that it's part of the challenge for the management team about we have to we have to deliver financial balance. It's a statutory uh, requirement, so we're clear we have to live within the resources we have available. We're very clear about balancing performance and meeting our performance challenges as well as making sure our quality. So we're very clear about the, the three strands around around that. So we keep the focus on, on that. And it's looking about different ways that you can deliver. It's looking at... Um, what you may be possible in the community around some of the outpatient services that you can use technology for that might be able to be delivered that way that means that people don't have to come to hospital, which then can free up capacity to meet some of the demand. So it's looking on a much wider basis. It also is looking at how we can help through, uh, and this is longer term, it's not immediate around some of the prevention agenda to try and take some of the pressure off the system. And that's quite difficult. You heard us keeping some of the priorities. We did the same around to keep well, et cetera, to keep our priorities in the prevention agenda to make sure it was trying to help minimise some of our demands. I mean, this is health visiting and to family nurse partnerships so along with the EDP and other things we really wanted to try as well as deal with the demand and make the savings but actually be a bit more thoughtful about the future in terms of where um, our priorities were as a board. I mean I think that question that that tension always between prevention and you know delivery on the ground when it's needed is is one that I think this committee has been discussing uh, you know for the for the last couple of years i mean um miles briggs and i vi uh, visited a, an access practice earlier on this week and you know there's a clear feeling there that many of the people we met who, who were in their 30s might not have been in the situation they found themselves in if there was greater emphasis put on early intervention for example i mean do you think we're getting that balance right yet in health we're getting better i think one of the challenges that we we face um as a National Health Service is sometimes the short termism um, and I think we have to think about so what is the long term strategy if we're really committed to prevention how do we intervene you know that's starting well the links to schools I think you know looking at targets sometimes they're very single 
and I think we have to think broader than that, where we actually have a, a picture of targets that actually make up. So w what is it that we're trying to achieve in terms of outcomes uh, linked to, say, you know, starting out well as a child so that we actually slow things down or we actually reduce expenditure. But the other <coughs> thing, just going back to the, the, to the original question about savings, I think we had a very good debate in relation to delayed discharges and if we did things differently, what could we actually reinvest? So I think we've got some work to do in terms of how we actually respond to the demand um, and reposition the investment as we go forward. Really hard. Every time in some of the MRI um, JBs to have prevention at the heart of what we do and just in a very simple thing, you talk quite a lot about governance today, the board starts with patient experience and patient safety, we look at our infection control um, and we always have a health improvement and prevention topic. So the board is really trying with everything we do to do the demand led as well as transforming as we've described health and social care integration but really try and keep the focus on prevention and the board, particularly non exam are challenging us all the time to do more and more of that and it's just we're just trying to balance those things and some of them will be very long term as you've described in the example you've given but we do have a focus on that it's just of how you do that at scale which I suspect all of boards and probably for a wider discussion are, are really struggling in how we, we make that much much bigger than the good work that we're doing well in each board. Of the patient safety just, just to give you an example so when patient safety was launched I think in clinical colleagues will keep me right, about 2008. We're now, we're now reaping the benefits of that huge improvement programme um, where we're actually reducing through prevention in an acute sector, um, infection and so on. So there, there is real things that we can do, but, but sometimes that takes a long time. And, and it's having that commitment to the long term and having that compelling vision that actually moves us forward in a way that we can actually demonstrate that we're making improvements as well as adjust as we go along uh, because we want to be as flexible as possible to get those improvements coming forward. Thank you. I think the, I think the committee would share the um, uh, aspiration to prevention and, and long-term thinking. However, there is an immediate challenge in this year to make these savings. And we've heard some of the challenges facing you in a, a number of fields. What do you envisage, what do you expect the impact on services to be of the savings you require to make in the next few months? I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll refer to um, Fiona in terms of, but, but we, have, we have choices to make. Every health board's got choices in terms of discretionary spend. And we do that in terms of if we, if we slow that down or if we don't do that right away, what's the implication on that? And we make those decisions almost every, every day. But um, in terms of the Fourth Valley situation, um, Fiona will have in-depth information that probably I don't have, so forgive me. We're trying to minimise the impact on performance. We, I think I was trying to stress that we are very clear that we have the three strands in terms of performance, quality and, uh, and finance. We do risk assess all our savings, not just from are they deliverable or not, but what the impact is on performance. So we are trying to look at, um, and we've been putting quite a lot of focus to ensure that we've got engagement with our um, clinical community around benchmarking, etc., and where there might be benefits. Again, it's a bit about looking elsewhere. So we're using discovery system, for example, to say, and, and that's at clinical level. It's not the execs around here. It's the clinicians looking at their their performance. Uh, and and also, I know Andrew has been leading around our, our look at realistic medicine and quite how how that might um, be able to. It's not about direct cost savings. It isn't a cash saving target, but actually over time that gradually change and helps to man manage demand and helps manage performance. Um, we Again, we'd look at where we're out of um, um, looking at I go back to prescribing. Um, so again, we look at primary care prescribing and where we are out of maybe out of line or we've got variability across the system so that we reduce that variability. We also invested in the HEPMA system around secondary care prescribing because the data has been there in primary care but not in secondary care to the same extent and we used a lot of the data in primary care to help drive that change so we should start to see the benefit of that. That's now embedded in our system so it means that the clinicians can see very clearly across their specialty what they're spending and that can bring, bring benefits, um, because it's one of our highest spending areas. 
people around you know how we use our current resources so sort of um, in terms of we work really hard to make sure that the nursing and midwifery nursing establishments are safe and effective and um, the cabinet secretary had launched the safe staffing legislation in Forth Valley and what we have shown we may not have the highest amount of nur nursing numbers in Scotland for example but we what we've got is safe staffing levels and our, our nursing staff on the wards and departments can demonstrate through the quality of care preventing falls preventing infection as the chief executive has mentioned caring for people and matching those nursing skills if you will with with direct patient outcomes and that allows me in terms of um, and the board are very very supportive of a range of things they've not been cutting staff posts and all of those things we've really tried to as Fiona said deliver on the services but this is a very real example of where the board can see using evidence-based tools and also see the care that the nurses are delivering and what matters to patients where the investment should be and again the board have, have protected and supported that and a range of things and nursing can't be um, obviously ring fenced or excluded but actually what they are able to do is look and see what kind of care we're delivering what that cost what does that is and what's the consequences of that and if we did need to make changes I could go to the board and describe the impact that it would have on services on such a large large important um, workforce as an example of using our resource as well. Thank you very much. The committee is also very interested in issues of governance, and I would ask Dave, David Stewart to... Uh, uh, thank you, Convener, and welcome to you all uh, this morning. Um, Angela Wells earlier mentioned the issue of governance. I'm very interested in p governance, particularly in your own audit committee. And as you will know, none of your council-appointed members have attended any of the audit committee this year. Why is that? No, <coughs> uh, no. this year, but... Uh, uh, we, ha we have one elected member on the, audit, on the audit committee. Now, since elections in May, uh, there has been there has been regular attendance from the elected member on that committee. Uh, prior to May, I wrote to all the chief executives pointing out the responsibilities on the councillors, and they, sh they, they should take that into account when they're appointing them. So I think. Uh, We've changed the actual culture on that. Well, so have you specifically, I'm glad to hear that, have you yes. specifically addressed this at formal board meetings about the non-attendance previously? Well, I dealt with it. I've, I've, I've spoke to the councillors individually, uh, the new ones that were appointed. I'd say I wrote to the, the chief executive council before the elections, before they the appointed new elected members to the actual board, pointing out the, the actual commitment. So I think we have uh, addressed that, that issue. Yeah, and pre you currently only have one council representative on the audit committee, is that correct? That's correct, right. yeah. So previously, did that affect the level of scrutiny or debate that you had when you no. had a no-show at the committee? No, we have uh, other non-elected, we have other uh, non-executives there as well. It's yes, just there's one mm -hmm. councillor as part of the non-execs. Mm -hmm. But clearly the council representative is very important. Because yeah. um, I suppose there is an argument, and I'm glad it's now been resolved, that who guards the guards? If you yeah. if you don't have these people attending, yeah. you know, there's an empty seat. Yeah. There's no debate. I can assure you, all our committees, that the scrutiny is is in, intense. We are well represented. We get good quality information uh, for us to do our job of, of scrutiny, particularly at the Policy and Resources Committee and our Clinical Governance Committee. We have our own scorecards, uh, and the information goes well beyond the statutory performance indicators. We we look at what's important to patients or performance and make sure that we we monitor that and we get regular regular reports. What's the attendance like for other members of the audit committee since the council election? It's it's good, yeah. Mm. It's good. There's there's not a problem there. Yeah. No. So if there's any if there's any failures in terms of attendance or contribution, what systems do you have in place to remedy that? Well, <coughs> then it's cabinet secretary that appoints appoints members. Uh, presumably, if a member w wasn't attending, then I would speak to the member. If that didn't uh, improve, then I would probably speak to the leader of the council. I'm saying probably because I've never had to go down that. I spoke to the chief execs and I wrote to the chief execs and I spoke to the new members when they're appointed, making it quite clear what their responsibilities were. Uh, other than the member that you referred to, we didn't have a problem with the other elected members in the previous administration. And they're on, a, they're on other committees because you said there's only one yeah. member. Yeah, yeah. They, they, are, they are represented on all our scrutiny committees. 
Right. Right. Well, it's good to hear that you've you've taken on board a problem area and addressed it because clearly having a well-functioning audit committee is vitally important. So I'm reassured to hear that. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. One of the aspects in which clearly the relationship with local government is particularly important is around integration joint boards, and there's been some discussion uh, of, of that today. Can you uh, tell me when this year's budgets were set for the integration joint boards and also... Uh, when will next year's budgets be set for the integration joint boards? So the, budget was, the budget was set on time. It was set in March mm. for the 1st of April. We are um, on track currently to set... Um, the, the final position will be on the 28th of March for the 1st of April. Fine. Thank, thank you. And, and some of the comments we've, we've heard as a committee in general... Uh, around integration joint boards is that uh, at the ward level, at the hands-on level, if you like, uh, at the uh, uh, different cultures that local government and NHS bring together uh, can work well, but that sometimes it becomes more difficult as that goes up the, up the chain of command, if you like. Uh, I wonder if there's comments from either the uh, joint board perspective or indeed the health board perspective about how that uh, uh, marriage of cultures is working within the boards. Speaking in a minute, she'll give the sure. short But can I say, as a, a health board, we are committed to making the integration actually work. We work well with the actual local authorities. Uh, <clears throat> there are discussions going on between health board chairs and chief execs and COSLA to improve relationships at a, a national uh, level, and, and we will learn from that. Uh, exercise, but we're all committed to making it, it work. We've talked about efficiencies, different ways of working, and w w we have to support more people in the community if we're going to give people a good quality of life and, 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 and care for them safely. And that requires good interactions between the council and, and health. We're totally committed. The other area we're totally committed to is community planning, and that it's a lot in the prevent. So we have very good relationships with the local authorities, and we work very closely with them. Uh, with a lot of good examples of joint working. I'd like she want to speak about the, the, the working at her level. <laughs> could, I, could I maybe yeah. just make an observation as somebody coming in new um, to, to Forth Valley? Obviously, I started on the 3rd of January, but um, Alec and my chairman um, in Orkney allowed me to actually attend a number of meetings. I was very struck with the transparency and the challenging conversations, because challenge is a really good thing to actually make improvement between the organisations. And at my last Falkirk Integration Joint Board, there was a number of key actions that I thought were really, really promising. But I suppose... And reflecting in the Forth Valley um, landscape, there has been a track record of integration, both at a community planning level and with council colleagues. The Care Village is just an outstanding example of that, where people have actually invested, because we can talk integration, but unless you see it actually being played out in action, and, and you know, as somebody new coming in, that would be my observation. I don't, I'm not worried about integration. I actually think we can actually take huge steps forward to actually make the changes that we know need to be done around the, the care pathway to support people in their own homes. I think ours is an unusual um, partnership in Clip Manager and Stirling. It has two local authorities, and so we have to work, I think, probably a little bit harder than some other areas to make sure that the, the, the variable cultures and the variable um, priorities um, that, that sometimes push and pull um, are taken account of. And as, as Cathy has said, that there is robust discussion. Our IGB is chaired by the leader of Stirling Council, who is extremely committed to the board and to integration. Um, and I think that's, that's a good signal because it's not all true of all of, of the integration joint boards. So, so they are signalling by presence um, and by commitment and by the robust discussions that we do have. And, you know, it, it, it's a challenging atmosphere to be working in but if, if you can keep the dialogue going and we have managed to do that we have managed to set the budgets we have managed to have um, pretty challenging discussions about priorities and about stresses and strains around in the system um, and found a way through there, there, there's nearly always a pragmatic 
view of finding a way through. And I meet regularly um, with, with the chief executives um, in order to keep that dialogue going and to make sure that we, we have a rounded view and a single view um, of, of the, the, the direction of travel. So, just just to, thinking about the, the connection to the wards, um, which is a very important uh, area. Um, yesterday, the, the Cabinet Secretary visited um, NHS Fourth Valley, and that was a discussion we had actually with the Colingo team. That was one of the, the, the questions I posed was, uh, as, a, as, as an ED team, what have you seen that's a direct result of integration, or, or have you seen anything? Um, and they were able to say, yeah, see that team down there that help people get home if we, if we don't think they need to be admitted. That, that was as a direct result of the communication around inter integration. So, so that, that for me was really interesting, hearing that very visible and, and associated with, with how we were working differently. Um, when Andrew and I were with the Cabinet Secretary yesterday who was listening to staff about how well they've been dealing with flu and other things, I've heard an, an ED consultant um, say um, if I had more money to spend, I would spend it in keeping people safe in their communities. And, 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 and my colleagues are incredible, but within that zone of caring for patients, sometimes the wider um, aspects of that, but actually an ED consultant was saying we need to shift that balance. We need to prevent people coming in here unless they absolutely need it. And it was really, really heartfelt. And I'm not sure I would have heard, heard that even two years ago. It was really, really, really powerful. And, and how do you as a board or as IGBs, how do you hear from the public that you serve? We has a, an engagement strategy and has regular engagement. We, we still have the public uh, forums in place. We've got the community planning partnership networks and there's, there's regular contact. We also uh, have the strategic planning group that has a cross cut um, of all of the stakeholders, including service users and carers. And there's feedback there. There's also individual feedback through service feedback loops that we already have in place. And some of those members of the patient and public um, are active in our patient and public panels in our inpatient services. So they're bringing that experience from across Fourth Valley to the IGBs as well as in these other. So they're voice of what matters to people when they're receiving services. So we have tried to, to integrate um, our active engagement in patient and public involvement, whether that's in our service use or whether that's in mental health or, or helping us make sure people wash their hands is really active and, and they're all linked to that process. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. My final question, I'm looking around colleagues that there are no other final questions lurking. Uh, my final question is on accident emergency performance over Christmas and New Year. And uh, I, you, will, you will know that the latest figures indicate Fourth Valley had the uh, poorest performance uh, over uh, uh, that period and meet, uh, against the four hour standard. Uh, clearly it would be important to get in the record uh, uh, what you have. Uh, to tell us about that and how you intend to address it going forward. So is the new person coming in um, before I in in invite Andrew just to give us some more details? I think I've been really, really struck. My first day in Fourth Valley, I spent in the ED department um, meeting staff. And uh, as a nurse by background, I was really struck by the calmness and the organisation around how we were looking after patients. Fourth Valley actually had gone out and bought extra beds so that people didn't have to wait in trolleys. And I just, I just thought that was a huge example of just the kind of commitment to good patient experience. The other thing that I was really struck with was the, the near patient testing. And it made me think about targets in the sense that Fourth Valley was putting care first. They were putting treatment first and target second. And while targets are extremely important, for me, with that clinical background, I saw firsthand clinicians, social workers, the whole team um, working hand in glove to make sure that the patient experience for those people who needed care urgently. Um, and I made it a point to actually write to patients who waited longer, who had to wait that bit longer, who were less urgent, if I can put it like that. Everyone always feels they're urgent. But for those patients coming in um, who really needed attention there and then, care was our priority. And that was, that was just great to see. Um, thanks, Cathy. I'll, I'll expand a little bit on what Cathy alluded to there um, when she referred to, to near patient testing. I think it's important to, to remember the context of the figures. Although it is a four hour emergency access standard, what that means is that there's actually lots of things happen within those four hours. It's four hours to complete that episode of care. So pe people are being seen, they are getting tested, they are being treated. 
um, and then decisions made about about where they should go thereafter. But but yes, when we looked at those figures at the beginning of December, and when I say look at, this wasn't a look back. We were seeing this very actively. A lot of us are very involved in day to day and monitoring of 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 how we're getting on and and what our ED looks like and what our uh, uh, assessment areas are like. When we saw what was starting to unfold, you're right. It was d gravely concerning because we understand exactly what Cathy says. That's the impact on the patients, the patients' experience, um, which is compromised. Then, um, so so we needed to find out rapidly what what was happening. We've seen through the the, the weeks in, in December just the, the evolving picture, which culminated at the end of of, uh, of December, and particularly uh, distressing figures. Um, wh what we've found, what we've discovered, is that uh, I mean, obviously, flu is everywhere, and everyone's reporting um, hugely increased numbers. I've been around. Um, winter planning for the last few years, and this is the first that we've planned every year for uh, for flu. But um, this is the first time I think we've seen the, the kinds of numbers that, uh, that of people have come in. And so, when people are admitted to hospital with a diagnosis of flu, um, th there's there's a couple of parts to that. Firstly, that's not health. Usually, people who have no other health issues. That usually, there's there's other what we call comorbidities. So, people that are coming in have other illnesses, um, and so are, co are complex. So, flu is part of that. Um, and what we've seen is, as a direct result of that, we've seen our length of stay for people with respiratory uh, and respiratory specialties. We've seen that go from last December from s four days up to this December of 14 days. So we're seeing a huge impact uh, from, from that group of patients because of the complexity. So that's one factor. The other factor is to, to refer to uh, Cathy's point near patient testing. So what is that? That's a diagnosis of flu within half an hour of turning up at the front door of the hospital. Previously, so in previous years, this is a, a brand new development this year. Previous years, um, that would require a diagnostic test to be sent to, to an external lab and the results would not come back for a couple of days. Why is that important? Because if you're making a decision about where someone can go, so it's, firstly, it's important because the patient then knows their diagnosis, they know they've got flu, their family know they've got flu, and more importantly, the staff as well can then try and implement our infection control policies to minimise the spread of that flu. But that's a step that we, weren't, we haven't been faced with before because we now know somebody's got flu A, or they've got flu B, or they've got RSV. And we could look across our capacity, our bed capacity, and we could see that actually, no, this person, according to our, our algorithms, our guidelines, that person can't go there, they need to go there, and there could be a delay inherent in that. So, so when, once we saw that start to unfold, that our policies needed to be different, needed to be a bit more flexible, and, and Cathy very quickly, uh, has, uh, even in the short time, she's been able to ask us to look at that again, just to see about our decision making, and, and, and we think we've improved on that, but that was, that was a, a very difficult month, and a very difficult month for our patients. Um, what, we, what we've seen subsequently is that our um, uh, performance has improved, it's been up to, it uh, went from in the, the, the high 50s, it went up into the 60 percent in the following week. It's now up into the 80 percent, and in the weekend, just gone, um, actually, our performance was well over 95 percent. So it's, it's in the high 90s. So, so we think we've we've uh, we've improved a lot of the system. A lot of things have happened over the weekend. It's been helpful, but actually, we, we think we've learned and and we've we've um, improved what we're doing. And will it therefore change any aspects of your winter planning? Absolutely. I mean, as, <coughs> as part of any winter planning, we would do a debrief. And we would, I mean, we've had to adapt to this as, we, as we've gone. So I think we've got the process in place. We're reassuring that we, we are continually monitoring um, wh where things are working well and not so well. But we will do a formal debrief as well in winter. And uh, this will need to, to be a key feature of what we decide to do next year. Absolutely. The Chief Executive described and Andrew's alluded to, um, and, and I was uh, in the hospital on Boxing Day when the kind of flu numbers were spiking and we were coming in, we knew where the patients, what type of flu the patients um, had and, and, and people were very understanding um, of, of the delay, although we were trying uh, to minimise it. But what we have seen um, is our staff were really, really calm, really, really supportive. We haven't had patients being assessed or lying in trolleys or so there was the e, &E department just to get the patients, as Andrew's described, out of any &E into a safe ward so they were not mixing people with flu A or flu B because actually patients we know can get the three types of flu and if you're already unwell or, or quite vulnerable as Andrew's described. So it did take us slow but we started to re-establish flow and get that much quicker. But the patients and the families understood. We were keeping them informed. They understood about the testing. The testing is a gargle wash so the patients were participating in that and they were understanding why we were moving. Patients were coming in. We were popping masks on them in assessment areas so we could prevent any spread of any types of flu to other patients. 
and we have our partners, particularly around, I mentioned earlier about the cleaning of our facilities and, and how that gives people confidence in us as a board and, and, and their environment um, and the cleaning services, whether that was Christmas Day, Boxing Day and all the days in between, including the holidays, we're coming behind the staff, the nurses and doctors and terminally cleaning places so we could free up spaces for patients. So we appreciate we need to do better, but actually our staff, and as Cathy said, really, really difficult situations. Ambulances coming up, our patients were being brought into the department and we were looking after them, not in corridors, not in trolleys, and those who were waiting long, they had full nursing and medical care during that time. So we would like to reassure, because otherwise we're doing a disservice to our staff who were absolutely incredible, which is why the Cabinet Secretary came out and thanked them and they really appreciated that. We have done too, but that might have meant a bit more than us keep saying thank you. I think, I think looking forward, um, so we have got a single target of 95%. And I think maybe we need to reflect on the, 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 the patients coming through. You know, is there an opportunity for us to actually think about reducing that standard in terms of patients who are actually presenting with minor injuries and being very clear at the outset about redirection and so on in Forth Valley? Um, because I, as Chief Executive, and I know my clinical directors will share this, it's making sure that we have a very safe system. And I would like some measurement around the safe system and are we actually caring for patients in an appropriate manner? So I certainly think as, as, a, as a health board, we would want to reflect on that. Um, and that will actually help us decide about where we actually invest in the future in terms of, is it the out of hours? Is it, you know, there'll, there'll be huge data that will come forward in terms of us actually prioritising going forward. And presumably that's something you could do without waiting for Oh, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we've actually started doing that redirection. It's just, but we, we, we'll learn from that intervention. Understood. A very uh, final supplementary from Emma Hub. Um, it's not too late to get the flu vaccine, and NHS staff members and social care staff members should get the vaccine. Are you doing anything to encourage the staff to continue to like take up the vaccine? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we'll continue to push the flu vaccination yeah are you monitoring the percentage the numbers yes. so yeah. at the i think it was the 4th of january we had about 40 percent of our staff i think just that raising awareness in the public domain people are now stepping forward i think the other thing that we're doing in force valley we've just we've actually asked our public health colleagues just this week is to actually use patients attending hospital to have the opportunity to where we can um, offer the vaccine, um, whether it's outpatients, whether it's at risk groups, and the so that we're actually targeting patients coming into our services. Um, GPs are doing that, but we, we've actually got an audience of patients that we could actually really be promoting that. So we've kind of ratcheted that up, and we hope that that will actually increase our figures even more. Thank you very much. That's been very comprehensive. Uh, you've had a lot of answers to give, uh, and uh, we uh, welcome the fact you've done that. Uh, after we have a discussion we may have some further supplementary questions uh, in which case we will write to you with those uh, uh, in the next few days so thank you all very much for your attendance thank you. and i conclude the public part of the meeting uh, we will now move into private session <laughs>